Okay, so evening everyone. Welcome from, uh, from all the corners of the world that you're joining from. Uh, my name is Julia from WSCT School London. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, for anyone who has not yet been to any of our webinars, we've been running a series of these um, while London has been under lockdown um, and we've been unable to do our normal series of events. While that has been disappointing, it's been great to see so many people join these. So I'm um, so glad to see you all here again for another um, what I'm sure will be excellent session uh, with Nina here on Tuscany. Um, so I'll pass over to Nina in just a second. The only thing I'd like to say is if you can just keep your questions until the end, um, we'll try and keep an eye on those and leave some space to answer those. Uh, and the recording for this will be available um, through our website or on YouTube afterwards. Uh, that's it from me, over to you, Nina. Uh, thank you very much, Julia. Thank you. Uh, and hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar, Discover Tuscany. Um, I'm sure a few of people, a few people, I already, I've seen a few pictures go past, and I've recognised a few faces. So, welcome to those people who know me. I think probably a few of you have attended some of these sessions up at Bermondsey Street in London. And if you haven't, then uh, make that one of your places to go next year because some of the sessions are fantastic. And for those of you abroad, then I actually think they should carry on with these webinars because I think it's great actually to be able to, to, to actually see some of these lectures without having to travel several thousand miles. So um, Tuscany, obviously, uh, in Italy, for those of you who know me, I married an Italian. Uh, so that's where my link to Italy com comes from. And I actually met my husband while I was living in Tuscany. So we both uh, spent quite a lot of time there, several years on and off in Tuscany. He was a medical student and I was bumming around Europe, as you do when you're in your early 20s. And that's where we met. And um, uh, we stayed there for several years and thoroughly got to love the region of Tuscany. Uh, I have many, many memories of sitting under the Leaning Tower of Pisa, getting slightly tipsy and uh, sitting in cafes, eating frog's legs and drinking Vinsanto. And I just, I just have the most glorious memories of living in Tuscany. It's, and my daughter, I sent her there. I say sent because she had absolutely no option. It was an absolute, you're going to have a gap year and you're going to go to Italy and you're going to learn to speak Italian. So I sent her to, <laughs> we sent her, I should say, to uh, Florence for her gap year. And she has always said that it was just one of the most rewarding years of her life. She just loved every single second of it. So if you haven't ever been to Italy, uh, Tuscany, I think, is probably one of the most visited parts of Italy. And it genuinely is stunning all the way around. It's full of architecture and history and the most fabulous food. And of course, rather a lot of good wine as well. So, um, Julie, can we move on a slide, please? Thank you. So just starting off, really, because I mean, I'm sure most of you know where Tuscany is, but it does, you, you know, you just, I can't assume that. So just to give you, just to clarify, you can see Italy there. So Tuscany is there in the sort of that, that blue area to the uh, west of the country. Uh, it goes right up to the Apennine Mountains, which run down the centre of Italy. You can see them all the way from Piemonte, Liguria, down the centre of Italy, all the way down to, to Sicily, the Apennine Mountains. And so many of the vineyards within Tuscany sit within the foothills of those Apennine Mountains, and they do have a big effect on, on the grapes that are grown there. You can see the left, the left map is, gives a little bit more detail um, on the regions that we find in Tuscany, and we will go into it in much, much more detail, obviously. But I think just you can see just from the, the map how hilly it is. So this is a hilly area. The whole of Tuscany, there's mount, small mountain ranges throughout the whole of Tuscany. And these have a big impact on the, uh, on the grapes that are grown and where they're grown. But it also, as you can see, has rather a large coastland. So um, not the, I have to say, not the greatest place to go if you want after a beach holiday, because there aren't that many beaches. But... Um, it has lovely cliffs and beautiful water, unless you're too close to Pisa in case the, the water there is not brilliant actually. But further south, beautiful clean waters and lovely, lovely, lovely coastland. There's, I think there's some more pictures coming up. But that coastland has a big impact also on the grapes that are grown and the wines that are produced there. So they, they're quite different, the wines that are produced on the, in the coastal ranges to those that are produced inland. And I'll talk about that. If I had my glasses of wine here, I'd be able to 
taste them, but I haven't. I'm just, I did see somebody is drinking a Morellini di Scanzano. So very nice. And, and a couple of people have got a Brunelli Montalcino. So even nicer. I'm just jealous, actually. Right, um, Julie, I will come back to these maps. So don't worry too much. And please, if there's a real question that you think you really need to know now, then please just pop it up there and Julia can shout it at me. Um, right, could you move on, please, Julia? So just a look at the climate and the soil. So I've just mentioned it briefly just there, but it has, Tuscany does have a warm Mediterranean climate, but especially at the coast. As soon as you go inland, you start to get protection. And if you look at that map, you can see that pretty much everywhere beyond the coast, there is some kind of mountainous area which protects the vines, but it also shields the vines from the warm Mediterranean air. So in fact, as soon as you get through those um, sort of coastal ranges, it gets a little bit cooler until you get to some steep slopes into Chianti Classico, where the steep slopes have then take that sun that just beats down on them. However, as soon as you get inland even further and you get higher up, you are then affected by the nighttime cold temperatures. And that obviously has an effect on the ripening of the grapes. So that really warm temperatures during the day, and cold at night. More rainfall inland. On the coast it's drier and it's warmer so that has an effect on the wines that are produced there and we'll talk about the grapes that are grown and the wines that are produced in those areas as we go through this seminar. Just a quick look at soils. I know some people love soil, some people just can't be bothered with them but I just I love soil. Um, Galestra is the main the important soil that we talk about when we talk about the soils of Chianti Classico. You find it throughout the whole of Tuscany but it has little spots of it Galestra and Albarese, uh, the calcareous sort of the soil in that bottom right hand picture. Basically most of Tuscany has these free draining soils which are great in fact for, uh, for grape growing. The, the perhaps one that is a little bit different is the soils that you find on the Maremma, which is the coastal ranges. So right actually on the coast, going down to the sea, there is clay and gravel. And in fact, we'll talk about it more later, but that clay and gravel is very similar to the kind of soils you would find in somewhere like Bordeaux, which is why in, in the Maremma, we have a lot of the Bordeaux international varieties grow there because they suit those clay gravel soils. Sangiovese, which is the main grape for in Tuscany, isn't that happy on that clay soil. So that's a one reason why it, it doesn't grow there quite so much. But again, we'll, we'll look at that in more detail a little bit further on. Uh, Julia, thank you. So this, I had to put this up here because anybody who, who knows me knows that um, I like to eat as much as I like to drink. And whenever you, whenever you teach about the wines of Italy, and in fact, anywhere, pretty much all the old world countries, but I kind of find the, the Italians, it's, it's more important. Culture and food is just as important, if not more so. Wine comes second, first comes food. That is the main thing. And the culture, wherever you are in Italy, has affected over millennia, if you like, the foods that they grow there and the foods that are, are that are grown there, produced there, will affect the grapes which are then grown because they have been designed over centuries to to match the foods that you eat. And it's no accident, you know, that the Sangiovese is tannic. You know, if it wasn't a tannic red grape, it wouldn't go anywhere near as well with that wild boar or with that Bistecca Fiorentina. So you you can see how that would work so beautifully mushrooms, truffles, the flavours, the strong flavours that you get in Tuscan cuisine just works so beautifully with the grapes which are grown in Tuscany and you find that everywhere in Italy. Also the, the, just the history of, of Tuscany, there's a lot of nobility, there's a lot of ancient wealth and it's a lot of those noble families which were those that invested in the vineyard in a lot of what has happened in the vineyard over the last couple of centuries has been promoted by those noble families. So it's, in a way you could say it's no accident that Tuscany has been successful as a wine region because of its history, because of its culture. And just having a look at that, you've got that, okay, I don't know how many you've had a Bistec alla Fiorentina, that's that big, enormous, thick steak, which is cooked on a really high heat, still almost raw in the middle, and then just left to rest in its own juices and then sliced downwards and so, oh, 
got, I can't explain how good that actually is. And the flavors, flavors of wild boar. The last time I was in Tuscany, I was in Siena, and we had a plate of pasta with a wild boar ragu with a bottle of Chianti Classico. And I can, sw I swear that that has just got to be one of the, the most divine. I can still remember what the food looked like on the plate because it left such an impression on me. And the wine, those kind of things, I think they're just as important as the wine that you drink. And porcini mushrooms, obviously, you know, the flavors, they match and they just lend themselves so beautifully to the cuisine. Although I have to admit those porcini are actually from Farnham. <laughs> So they're in Surrey in England, but um, and no, I can't tell you where they, I picked them because of, because there are too many of you to kill in one go. So um, I can't tell you where I got them. But uh, the, the flavours of those mushrooms, along with Tuscan wines, is just perfection. They do go rather well with wines from other places as well. But I just have to, I always have to bring this up because I just think if you understand a bit about the culture of a region, and you understand a bit about the food, food and the flavors you would expect to get. It just makes so much more sense when you taste those wines. And Italy, almost without exception, the wines are drunk to go with food. And here in Tuscany, I would say almost more so because something like Sangiovese, the main red grape, the acidity levels, the tannin levels in there, without food, it just doesn't work so well. So when you're, for those of you that are tasting, you've got a glass of something, if you can, I would recommend that just grabbing a little piece of meat or cheese or something umami or something, especially a bit of protein, and you'll just see how that changes immediately the flavors of the wine, especially the tannins. The protein and the tannins just work together and it just changes everything. So I would definitely recommend that you try and do that. And sorry, you're always all going to be absolutely ravenous by the end of this uh, session if you haven't eaten already. Okay, um, Julia, please. Thank you. Right. So um, just we've got to talk about the Tuscan whites because uh, they're important, although I think most people, when they think of Tuscany, they do think of red wine. And quite rightly so, because the white production is really quite small in comparison. But I wanted to bring up two in particular because I think a undervalued. A lot of people don't have, have never heard of the first one, the Vernaccia. Um, but I just think if, you know, everybody drinks the same thing, not everybody, because you're a wine lover, so you probably actually have a very diverse uh, cellar or you drink lots of different wines, but it's amazing how many people, if you ask them, have they ever heard of a Vernaccia di San Gimignano, they'll say no, you know, because it's a small quantity of wine. And in fact, it's also, it's decreasing as well. I think it's quite sad it's decreasing. It's because they're harder to sell. So if you happen to own a vineyard covered in Vernaccia grapes and you can sell them, you can sell that wine for so much, so many euros per bottle, but you can get an extra five euros per bottle if you make Chianti, then you kind of, you can't, you know, you, why grow it, I suppose. But I think it's a shame. And I think uh, if you've never had Vernaccia di San Gimignano, this is homework I'm setting you. Um, you need to find one and taste it because they, it's, it's a very interesting grape. It's not like anything else, really, Vernaccia. It has a it has classic, fresh Italian acidity. It can sometimes be even slightly meaty. So it actually goes well also with meat rather than just with fish. You can have it with vegetarian meals. It goes really well. But it, it always has this slight bitterness to it. And it has quite a nice, a good mouthfeel. So it's not, I don't really know ever how, what to compare it with as another great variety. But I think it's definitely one to try. Somebody drinking one. Somebody, so I can't read the little thing is without the glasses. Oh yeah, so yeah, the Vermentino. So the, the next, the Vermentino, this, now this is a little bit of a personal opinion. So um, everybody has, everybody likes different things. I love Vermentino. It is definitely, at the moment, one of my favorite grape varieties. And, uh, and I think, I, I see it as being a future grape that we, we will all be drinking in large quantities. If I'd done this presentation, 10 years ago, that probably wouldn't have been on this slide because it's a relatively recent, uh, a recent advance that Vermentino started to be grown more and more in Tuscany. And it's good actually, because without Vernaccia, you take away Vernaccia and the only other grape, white grape that was grown in any quantity was Malvasia and Trebbiano Toscano. Now Trebbiano Toscano, as, as I've noted there, I think I don't really need to say anything else. It's just... <laughs> 
it's useful for, me for, for making brandy, but not really anything else. Um, uh, but uh, Vermentino, I've got a noise there, Julia. Have you got something? Okay. Uh, Vermentino, uh, on the other hand, it's just the most beautiful grape. It, gr it ranges from really quite light and zesty right through to something with almost an oily texture to it. Lovely mouthfeel, citrus, almonds, peaches, pears. It, it, ca it can be a really quite delightful grape. And it's growing in popularity in Tuscany, especially on the Maremma, especially on the coast. And if you think about it, that does make sense because Vermentino is most famous perhaps in, in Sardinia where there's a lot of Vermentino grown in Sardinia. And again, another piece of homework for you. Try a Vermentino from Sardinia. Obviously try one from Tuscany, but it is still, there's not a huge amount of it being exported yet, but I believe it will get, there will be more and more. Also in Tuscany, it's a lot of the top producers that are taking it on. So we're finding a lot of the top Chianti Classica producers are a lot of the, uh, the Tuscan, um, uh, the Tuscan producers at the coast are making Vermentino and unfortunately because they are the sort of the big boys and the big girls if you like the, the, these wines can be really quite pricey so they're not exactly accessible to everybody so just as a trial if you want to get to know the great Vermentino then I would suggest Sardinia, um, um, Piemonte it's known as Favorita, Languedoc Roussillon in France, they are starting to grow more and more Vermentino for I think the same reason. It actually just such a lovely grape. And of course in Tuscany. So you, it is around and it's just, can you tell? I like it. <laughs> it's, an, it's a lovely grape. So that one, homework, go and try some Vermentino because it's delicious. Okay, um, Julia, please, thank you. Uh, just a question there, whether or not they differ. Um, a little bit, yes, because Sardinia and um, Sardinia and Corsica, they've been growing Vermentino for centuries. And so very much you can go in range from styles from very, very light and easy, easy drinking, right up to some extremely important Vermentino. In Tuscany, like I said, it's very much being grown by some of those important producers on the coast. And so the styles are really quite luscious, so a little bit bigger. But as, as it becomes much more of a popular grape, I think we will start to see it being grown in a much more easy drinking style in Tuscany as, as it becomes more and more popular. Right, so moving on to, to Chianti. And uh, as you can see, I've got Chianti Ruffin out there, Carmignano. There's a lot of information on this page, so please feel free to go back and have a look at it another time. But just to, uh, just to sort of clarify things a little bit, Chianti is obviously the main producer of red wine in Tuscany. It's, it's huge. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you some information about Chianti and Chianti Classico um, several times over, I should imagine, because I don't know how many of you have drunk Chianti Classico regularly, sorry, or Chianti regularly in the last 20 years. But those of you who are sort of maybe my age or even older, will probably remember Chianti in these bottles with a straw, with the straw bottle. Believe it or not, they're actually coming back again. <laughs> I started to see them for sale again, which I think is bizarre because it must be very, very difficult to produce. But um, they did go through a period when the quality of Chianti and also the quality of Chianti Classico, I think there's no point in pretending, was really, well, rustic and rough were definitely words which often came up when you talked about Chianti and Chianti Classico. There was very definitely a movement amongst Chianti producers to produce quantity over quality and quite rightly in many respects because it was it was sold all over the world. Millions and millions and millions of bottles of Chianti and Chianti Classico were sold all over the world. So it was a case of you had to grow a particular vine which would produce a large amount of grapes because every single bottle you made, you could sell it. Now, this is something that has changed dramatically. I cannot express enough how much this has changed. And I'll explain it to you more on the next page, but there's the change of quality in Tuscany with Chianti and Chianti Classico is just outstanding. It's actually really hard now to pick up a bottle of Chianti, even a bottle, of, you pay, you've walked into a cafe in 
in Florence or anywhere and sat down and you've got a carafe of Chianti and it's absolutely, there's nothing wrong with it. You can't say, oh my God, this is rough and it's rough as old boots. It's just not. They're just genuinely well made. The fruit is different. The way the producers are making them is different. The quality of the grape is different. The whole, just everything is different. So by when you finish this webinar, your next bit of homework, and I promise I won't give you any more than this, is to just go out and try lots of different Chianti's because you will be genuinely surprised how well made they are, even at the lower price points, compared to perhaps, especially if you're older like me, that you, what you remember. Because those days, I trust me, they are well and truly gone. It's really quite hard to get those kind of wines anymore. Now, one of the things that's happened to change that is, um, is what is the Chianti Classico 2000 project. Now I'm going to go into that a bit more on the next slide, but it has changed the quality of the fruit that's going into these grapes, has sort of like trickled down through the whole system. It used to be that you, want, you needed to make as much fruit as you possibly could to make a Chianti. Now they, the Consorcio of Chianti has, made, has got much stricter regulations the yield has been reduced. The um, amount of grapes that can go into it, it's now 70% Sangiovese, up to 100. It used to be that you couldn't have more than 70% Sangiovese in the blend. And you had to, uh, back in, in the beginning when Chianti Classico became a DOC, had to have some white grape in there. There was all sorts of the, sort of like the, um, um, the method of producing it has changed. Everything about it has changed. These days you can stick pretty much anything in it up to sort of 20% um, 20, 20 Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Tempranillo, anything you want. There are 40 recognized varieties that you're allowed to put in there. A couple of them which are quite important, well, I think they're important. Uh, one of them is Canaiolo Nero. So this is a grape which was again used for, it's a local grape, it's a Tuscan grape, and it was always seen as a, just as a, a bit of a workhorse. But in fact, if Sangiovese is grown well, and it's grown with quality in mind, you end up with a grape which has good structure, good tannin, and good fruit. Now, the only problem with a grape which has really good structure and good tannin is sometimes they can be a bit hard and firm. Now, Canaiolo is the opposite. If you could almost say it's like the blend that you would have Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot in, in Bordeaux, the the Merlot takes the edges off the Cabernet Sauvignon, rounds the wine out. Canaiolo is exactly that. So it, we've seen an increase in the last couple of decades in, San, in uh, Tuscany with planting of Canaiolo Nero and bl being blended more and more with Sangiovese. So, and we've actually seen, although you're allowed to use all these international varieties, we've started to see a lot of producers growing more of the local varieties and stopping growing Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot and Cabernet Franc and Syrah, et cetera, and actually putting, going back to Canaiolo and another one called Colorino, which gives a little bit of color and a little bit of finesse to the wine. So it's just, it's just really interesting to see how things have changed and just that little bit of Canaiolo, which just softens off the, the, um, the Chianti. Uh, just to note there that the Chianti has several subzones, and they're all good. Gen genuinely, they are all good. Uh, some of them are better than others because of where they sit within within the region uh, and the one which for me stands out is Chianti Rufina so that if you can see on that map on there Rufina is that dark purple little dot in the top right hand corner area of Chianti so you've got the frog-like shaped area that's the one thank you Julia so and the, what's special about Rufina is that you can see how far inland it is so we're right up into the Apennine Mountains here, right up into the foothills. So relatively high altitude, far away, as far as you can get from the influence of the warm air coming from the sea. Also, the, the slopes here are really quite steep. So during the day, the vineyards take some really a beating from the sun, but at nighttime, the, the temperatures drop like a stone. So that big diurnal temperature variation slows the ripening down of the, of the grape and you end up with a quite a different uh, impression of um, expression of Sangiovese than you do from other parts of Chianti. 
the wine has an elegance to it. It has quite firm tannins. So in fact, these wines often lend themselves to a little bit of aging, but they also have this most extraordinary aromas that you get in Chianti. It has this beautiful violet roses kind of nose, something that, an elegance, that's how I would describe them. For me, uh, people who know, know that I like Tuscan wines, I, I'm a real Chianti Rufina fan. I just find the elegant side of them is just exactly where I like to have my wine sit. They always, but they always have this fabulous Tuscan bite to them as well. It's just that, yeah, I like it. It's really good. And uh, the other one to, to note here, and um, this is not a Chianti, it's Carmignano. Now, I, has anybody had Carmignano? It's one of those, it used to be quite popular several years ago. And I think it's a shame that it's fallen out of favor a little bit. I don't know why it has. Maybe because the quantity, the production is really, really tiny. Um, but this is another one that you should hunt out because these wines can be absolutely stunning. From the top producers, and there aren't many producers because it's such a tiny area, but the wines can be genuinely stunning. They have to have some Cabernet Sauvignon or Franc in them. That's kind of the law. And you think, well, why is that? It's because Cabernet Sauvignon in Carmignano is not a new grape. It's actually been grown there for about five centuries. So it's, it's a, it sits there very, very comfortably, probably a slightly different clone to the, that you would find up in Bordeaux, but it is an old grape for Tuscany, Cabernet Sauvignon, it's not new. So they've been, for, for, you know, for centuries, they have been practicing how to blend Sangiovese with Cabernet Sauvignon and they do it extremely well. And if you've got a, a special dinner coming up and you want to put something a little bit special on the table, but don't want to pay super Tuscan prices, or, or, or sort of like a Gran Selezione Chianti Classico, then I would say this is very definitely the one that you should try because they can be absolutely stunning. Um, Julia, could you move on please? Thank you. So Chianti Classico. Okay, for me, uh, Tuscany Chianti Classico, I just love it. Um, People often say to me, uh, they often ask me, if you were, you know, what's your use of your um, Treasure Island wine? You know, if you had to, if you had something, what would you have? And I say, you know, I'd probably have a Chianti Classico. I just, um, I love the grip that you get from a good quality Sangiovese and the bite that you get from it and the fruit and the tannin and the length and its ability to match with food. I just think it is. I just think it's really good. And, and the fabulous thing about it also is the improvement, the difference between Chianti Classico now to how it was 15, 20 years ago. Certainly there have always been some extremely fine producers of Chianti Classico, but they were a minority. Whereas things have changed enormously. Just like Chianti, it used to have um, a maximum amount of Sangiovese and that has changed you can now up to have 100% Sangiovese in the blend. A lot of producers do that now because they consider it to be a high quality grape, whereas perhaps before it was always seen as being a little bit of touch and go, you're never quite sure why. And the reason for this is because Sangiovese as a grape variety mutates enormously, constantly. So a little bit like for those of you who your burgundy lovers amongst you, in the same way that Pinot Noir mutates, constantly. Sangiovese mutates. So throughout the whole of Tuscany there are hundreds and hundreds of different clones of Sangiovese and if you consider that over centuries throughout the Chianti Classico vineyards there are hundreds of different clones of Sangiovese. Now throughout the whole of Tuscany so for example we're talking about somebody drinking Brunello. Brunello is a clone of Sangiovese Somebody was drinking the Morellino di Scansano. Morellino is a clone of Sangiovese. Uh, if you are having a Vino Nobile from Montevolciano, it is a different clone of Sangiovese called Prugnolo, Gentile. So wherever you are, there are different clones which have developed over centuries. Now what happened in Chianti Classico is that there came a point, and this is perhaps down to the advent of the Super Tuscan, which had this effect on the Chianti Classico region, there came a point when they appreciated that some producers were making superb Chianti Classico and yet down the road the wine was shocking. So it was a case of we need to do something. So with government funding they 
had uh, decided to start a project to find out which were the finest of those Chianti Classico clones. So they, it started in 1988 and it took hundreds and hundreds of clones of, of Sangiovese from the whole of the region, planted on several different sites with different aspects on different soils over several years, 16 years of trial and error, using them in wineries to see how they would react, what would happen during fermentation, etc., how they developed after the first two or three years of life. And so you started to see which clones worked best. So each winery could actually say, by 2000, I have this southeast facing vineyard on Albarese soil. It's at this altitude, which is going to be the best clone for me? And they could choose. So there were about 10 top clones which came out, which were considered to be the highest, highest quality. And since 2000, almost 80% of Chianti Classico vineyards have been replanted. So we, the, the difference in quality from when we were looking 20, 30 years ago to now, because of course those vineyards which were being planted between 2000 and say 2010, those vines are now maturing, the fruit is now at a much higher quality. So within the last five years, we've really started to see, you know, vines with deeper roots and we've started to see this extraordinary quality coming out of Chianti Classico. It's been quite stunning, the difference in quality throughout the whole region. So this, and this of course, has had an effect on not just on Chianti Classico, but also on Chianti, because of course the Chianti producers outside of the classical region have said, well, we'll have some of that. And uh, so it's, it's spread and it has been truly, truly stunning. So yeah, okay, I'm not trying, trying not to make, give you too much homework, but uh, what I, rather than homework, I would say those amongst you who are genuinely the kind of people who like to lay wine down. If you're a Bordeaux lover or a Burgundy lover and you like to buy the special, the really top end Rioja, I would say start buying Chianti Classico and buy them from good producers and lay them down for a little while. The reason I say that is because already we've started to see a hike in price as people have started to appreciate. A, this has cost people a lot of money to replant their vineyards, so they're having got to get that money back but also the quality difference. You can genuinely sell these wines for, for a lot more than we used to sell them. So I would say buy them now because they're only going to go up in price from these top producers. These superb top end Chianti Classicos are going to be really worth it when you open them 10, you know, five, 10 years time. So trust me, go out and buy some. And on that note, just having a look at uh, the levels of Chianti Classico that you have there, uh, just as a note, the Reserva wines have a, have a little bit more time in wood. And Gran Selezione, you may not have heard of Gran Selezione. This is a relatively new um, uh, level of Chianti Classico. And it was, it's, it was when the Chianti Classico producers said, look, we have a particular vineyard, which is better than somebody else's particular vineyard, even after the, the 2000 project. It's special. So it's almost like moving towards a crew system. And maybe that will come in time that they will be, they'll become a, a crew level. But Gran Selezione is very definitely, um, a, a, it's, it's, a, it's been brought in to say these, these grapes come from a single vineyard, from a single winery. They've been made purely and solely in that winery from the top level grapes in that winery. So you can be guaranteed, and, and they are genuinely, I haven't had one that hasn't been superb yet genuinely superb quality wines and these are wines that you could definitely invest in and put them away for 6, 10, 15 years and you will get so much back from them. They are genuinely, the quality is superb. And just a little note on that, um, today's Chianti Classicos are very different to how they used to be and so you will, you will be genuinely surprised if you haven't been drinking them for the last few years. Uh, Julia, thank you. Uh, Nina, just a few people wanting some re uh, rec recommendations for producers. Yeah, uh, uh, I suppose, yeah, the, I mean, oh, crikey, I mean, there are a lot of them now. I suppose one that always springs to mind for me is Fontori. Uh, the vineyard you see in front of you, I think, is actually Panzano, which is an area within Greve in Chianti, uh, which is considered sort of like the golden shell, and it sits in this little amphitheatre of vineyards, and Fontori's Chianti Classico 
is certainly one I would I would go for. Um, uh, oh crikey! Well, um, uh, Antinori makes beautiful Chianti and All of them. I, I can't I can't stress it enough. It really is really difficult to buy a Chianti Classico and not be thoroughly happy with what you have. Um, yeah, I, yeah. It would just take me too long to name them all. Honestly, just have a look. Uh, be guided a little bit like by price I suppose because there are some co-ops but even the co-ops the quality is really good it's it's the bad stuff is well and truly gone okay trust me and if it hasn't you can shout at me later <laughs> right so uh, just a, a, a few words on vino nobile uh, vino nobile di montepulciano not to be confused with Montepulciano d'Abruzzo because a lot of people do confuse these two. Montepulciano here is the town Montepulciano. It sits on a hill. You can see that photograph in the uh, bottom right hand corner. Uh, it's quite beautiful, so it's definitely one worth uh, visiting. Montepulciano the Great is Montepulciano d'Abruzzo. So they have no connection whatsoever. Okay, so Montepulciano d'Abruzzo is a great variety grown in Abruzzo, which is on the eastern coast of Italy. And this is Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, Montepulciano being the town, okay? Now, again, Sangiovese is the main grape. Here it's known, the clone is Pruniolo Gentile. Having said that, I have seen over the last few years um, a little bit of movement here because uh, after what happened in Chianti Classico, a lot of the uh, Vino Nobile producers said, well, um, you know, those grapes are such high quality, we're going to have some of those. So it's a little bit, uh, there has been a bit of movement here to the, to the clone, and uh, perhaps not all of them are Prugnolo Gentile anymore. Uh, we'll see what happens. This is going to be an interesting area to watch over the next couple of decades and how they react to what happened in Chianti Classico. Again, Canaiolo Nero, that's that lovely soft grape which sort of softens off the edges. And uh, Mamolo is quite important here as a grape. You please don't have feel you need to remember these, but it does. Uh, Mamolo is a, has a lovely violet uh, aroma to it, and it's something that you often pick up when you taste a vino nobile. It has this lovely sort of like um, floral, but often quite herby as well. The wines here in, in vino nobile. Uh, I I have to say that I love vino nobile di Montepulciano, but uh, one thing that I found recently in the last few years as people have started to move a little bit towards um, modern winemaking and introducing French barrique. Um, I prefer it without. <laughs> I just think the grape itself shows itself so much better and actually this applies to Chianti Classico as well. I pers and this is a personal opinion, I prefer my Sangiovese without new oak unless you're planning to leave it for several several years of aging when the oak has time to integrate but I just think the aromatics that you get in Sangiovese and the beautiful sort of cherry aromas that you get I just find that they can be overpowered by by new oak and unless you unless they're extremely intense wines and they've got years and years of aging on them I personally prefer those traditionalists that use no barrique at all and they use the big big Italian oak botti, which is this huge, great big barrels with usually old wood. I just think, and I know this is a personal opinion and some people are modernists and some people are traditionalists, but uh, I'd be lying if I said I like those as much because I don't really. Um, but we'll see, we'll see what changes. I suspect that over time that a lot of producers will actually sort of, say, in fact, I know this has already happened where people started using barrique and then have actually started using less and less as they start to appreciate that as the quality of fruit goes up you don't need to have an oak barrel to lend something to it actually the fruit just speaks for itself and interestingly in Vino Nobile relatively recently there has been a map of soils produced so there was a lot of research done here and there's now a map I think you could probably get it on the consortium on the consortium's website I think and they're planning to use that map to actually not bring in a crew system into Vino Nobile, but to help consumers understand the difference between the, the different areas of Vino Nobile. But this is very new, so you won't really, you won't see it much at the moment, but it'll be interesting to see how that develops over the next couple of decades and how you'll see different wines coming out of different areas and why that is, because it wasn't really looked into before. So I think that's quite exciting. 
Uh, Ed, just a little note on Rosso at the bottom there. Uh, Vino Nobile can be quite expensive. Um, and Rosso can be really good. And especially uh, from slightly lesser vintages when perhaps good producers have downgraded their Nobile grapes. They just think, okay, it's not such a great vintage. So I'll just, I'll put this in the Rosso. And it's a great, it's a great restaurant wine, Rosso di Montepulciano. Thank you, Julia. Okay, Brunello. Uh, Brunello. I, I know that a few of you there are drinking Brunello di Montalcino, so well done, very nice. Uh, have I got one here? I don't think I have time to read that. It's quite shocking that I haven't got one here, actually. I was just saying to Julia before I started that uh, I popped down to my cellar and just to pull out a few bottles, interesting bottles from. Um, from the cellar from Tuscany and was quite disappointed by how few I actually had down there. I didn't have, got no uh, Brunelli Montalcino down there, which is, so if anybody, I'll tell you my birthday's in November. Uh, it, it is a stunning, stunning wines. And when we do these tastings in, um, at, at Bermondsey Street, uh, I always include a Brunello in the tasting and it, they never fail to impress completely. Uh, you wonder how they can be so completely different. Even, even the top Chianti Classico, Gran Selezione, and some of the Super Tuscans, there's something about Brunello which is just, uh, it just always, everybody is always stunned by the flavours and, and the structure and the elegance of these wines. And uh, for, for those of you, I'm not sure if anybody amongst you has ever attended, uh, but uh, one of the tastings that we do at WSET at Bermondsey Street is uh, an Italian icons tasting. And in that tasting, we always include Biondi Santi's uh, Brunello di Montalcino because Biondi Santi was the starter. He started the whole Brunello di Montalcino story. Everything came from him. And this, again, comes down to the clone of Brunello, which is a Sangiovese clone. He noticed... Um, Clemente Biondi Sandi noticed that in his vineyard he had particular, a particular area of vines which had this very small uh, little grape with a thick skin and quite and he when he actually made wine out of those particularly and left out the other vines that they gave this extraordinary flavour and intensity of flavour that he didn't have from his other vines. So he pulled up the rest of his vines and he 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 spread those particular vines throughout the rest of his vineyard so he reproduced them he used a mazar selection and reproduced them so he just had this particular clone and that's where brunello comes from so he, th that was then from there on it grew and he, from the very beginning he put a lot of work into this and to this day they still the uh, beyond the santi family still are doing uh, clonal selection and to the point where they still are trying to keep that original Brunello clone, which I think is now, okay, there might be somebody there who might um, tell me I'm wrong here, but I think it's called Brunello 11 or something. It's a cl particular clone, which uh, he, they have managed to work out is the original one from when he started. And uh, the, the wonderful thing about Biondi Santi is, is the elegance of the Brunello wines. Many other Brunello producers over the years Still using the Brunello clone, obviously you have to have modernized the wines, there's new oak being introduced, uh, different parts of the whole region. So if you're in the southern area of Brunello, it's a little bit warmer. And so those wines show slightly differently to the northern part or where often some of the producers will blend Brunello from the eastern side from the, with the northern side and etc. So th there are differences. Um, and people do have preferences. Some love the modernist style, some with the new oak, some love the traditionist style without any oak at all. Uh, a little bit more aging in some of them are released many, many years later. So the, the, there are huge differences here, but I think um, one of the wonderful things about it, and I, and I got that clip down in the bottom left-hand corner, I just think it describes it. I think if I could try to describe Brunello, I wouldn't do it so well. And I just love this intense, persistent, ample and ethereal. I think that just describes it so, so well. And that sort of the sense of undergrowth, aromatic wood, berries, light blue, it just elegant, harmonious, vigorous and racy. It always has that fantastic Tuscan bite to it. I just, it's beautiful. Unfortunately now they, they are 
the money is going up and they are now really quite expensive, Brunelli Montalcino. So it is a special occasion wine. They are extremely good. There have over the years been several attempts to introduce other varieties. So for example, in Chianti Classico now, in Vino Nobile, you can use up to 20% of, and, and in Vino Nobile, 30% other varieties. And uh, they've tried to do this in Brunello and several producers are still fighting. We want to be able to use a bit of Cabernet Sauvignon, a little bit of Merlot, Syrah, whatever. Uh, but every year they fail and they're not allowed. Now you'll see that little note down there in the right hand corner of the screen, Brunello, Brunello Gate. There was a period um, in the 80s where very definitely, in the 90s, sorry, where very definitely we saw lots of Brunello di Montalcino was much, much darker and much more intense and flavoursome in different ways than it used to be. And, and initially I think it was put down to, you know, modern winemaking and maybe the way you were treating the vines and the vineyards, but eventually it was just worked out, actually they were just adding other grapes in there to the point where some producers decided, okay, enough, we need to do something about this. And there was, um, well, you call it a scandal, um, you know, all the, every single bottle was actually tested in, in that vintage and a lot of them got into a lot of trouble. And if you were very lucky and you happened to buy the Toscana IGT, which resulted from that scandal, you will have bought it for a lot less than you would have paid for your Brunello and it would have still been extremely good. But to this day, you're not allowed to include any other grape variety. It is 100% Sangiovese Brunello in, in the wine. Although there are, I do hear rumors occasionally that there are still the odd producer that sneaks a little bit. Of there you go. Uh, for those of you that are drinking your Brunello, how is it? Just a couple of notes would be quite nice. Uh, Julie, if you want to move on, thank you. So this is um, uh, moving on to the Tuscan coast. So for those of you now, I was describing, actually, can you just go back a, um, a slide, please, Julie? I just forgot to mention something, actually. Um, one of the reasons I just wanted to, for the students amongst you, one of the reasons why Brunello, uh, the grapes, are riper and more intense than other parts of Tuscany is to do with where it sits, its geographical situation. So, um, Julie, can you just move on a slide again? So you see the map there, I mean, I've got everybody's faces in front of it actually, but I'm just going to try and remember what it's behind your faces. Uh, on that map there, you can see that every single part of Tuscany, the Tuscan vineyards, is protected from any influence from the sea, apart from the Tuscan coast and apart from Brunello di Montalcino. So if you look at Montalcino, you can see that there is a gap that runs from the coast through a valley up to the town of Montalcino. Can you see that? And that is the warm air coming in from the sea is the only part of Tuscany where that warm air actually gets through. And that has a massive effect on the ripening of the grapes. So they, it is warmer and drier there than it is in pretty much the whole other part of Tuscany apart from on the actual coast itself. Does that make sense? Okay, Julia, sorry, move on, thank you. Oh no, don't move on because we're on the right, we're on the right page. Uh, so we're in on the Maremma and Morellini di Scansano. So uh, talking about Maremma, uh, this is a new area. Okay, so you, if you've never heard of Maremma and you've never heard of, um, uh, of Morellini di Scansano, it's because this is new. And Morellino is not new, it's not, a, it's not a new area, but it's relatively new to, uh, to the wine trade in that it was, these wines were grown locally, they were drunk locally. There has been recent interest by the rest of the world, and that's mainly because of the Tuscan coast. So the, Tusca, the, the phenomenon of the Tuscan coast started with the Super Tuscan, Sassicaia, so for anybody who doesn't know what size sky, it looks like that. Yes, and no, you can't have any, it's mine. Give it a nice stroke. Uh, so uh, everything started with Sassicaia in San Guido, the estate at San Guido, and it uh, made, basically uh, alerted everybody to the fact you could actually grow grapes and make good wine on the Tuscan coast. And since then, it has just spread like wildfire. So that whole area 
running down from Bolgheri there down to Grosseto is now a lot of it there are vineyards whereas before you would have seen strawberry fields you would have seen um, uh, peach trees and you would have seen cowboys and now that I know that sounds a bit daft but and that picture of those cowboys is real and uh, the um, the the cowboys of the Tuscan coast are a very real thing they're still mostly cattle there's a lot of cattle on the Tuscan coast and it is still mostly herded by cowboys so I, that's not a joke it is a real thing so a lot of that area uh, is still there's a lot still a lot of cattle but there has been a lot more movement to planting grapes here now the difference is the climate here is very different to the climate that you find inland so where you have that protection from the warmth inland here it's too warm really for Sangiovese. At least it's too warm for Sangiovese that is grown in Chianti or in Chianti Classico. It just, the grape variety just loses everything. It becomes flabby, it loses its fruit, apart from More, Morellino. Now Morellino is a clone of Sangiovese, again, but it's been there for centuries. So it, over centuries it has changed and it has mutated to the point where it is very happy to grow in the warm climate of the Tuscan coast. However, in, since, since Sassicaia, a lot of producers tried growing Sangiovese on the Tuscan coast and it just doesn't work. So in fact, most of the vineyards on the Tuscan coast, on the Marema, are international varieties. So Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, uh, Merlot, although in fact, recently, I think a lot of producers have decided that it's a bit too warm for high quality Merlot. Again, the Merlot loses its structure loses its acidity, it just isn't as good as it perhaps it could be. Uh, so it is Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Syrah, other international varieties. And in fact, one of the things I was going to ask you guys, if anybody's been there recently and seen any really interesting grapes are uh, being planted there, I'd love to know because I haven't been to the Maremma for a few years. So it's just one of those, I, I just find that very interesting. So do put that down there, I'd be interested. Uh, but it's, it's a very beautiful part of Tuscany. And it's very interesting and very new. So as yet, we don't really know what's going to work there best, apart from obviously Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. And Merlot works in certain places, Syrah, Cabernet, um, Cabernet Franc, obviously. So these are what that's what we're looking at here. And they are very beautiful and often very expensive. So good luck with trying those for homework. Um, okay, let's um, uh, let's move on, please, Julia. So this is the bit where we, um, uh, again, like I mentioned, that we do the Italian icons tasting in uh, at the WCT. If you get a chance, do come along. I prom I choose some of the most beautiful wines uh, made in Italy, and I have great fun in choosing them. And we will always have one or two Super Tuscans in there. Uh, this is the home of the Super Tuscan. So that Bolgheri, the town of Bolgheri, uh, is where it originated with Sassicaia. So that's where it all started. Since then, of course, there's been a lot of producers have started planting grapes there, so it now has its own DOC. Bulgari Superiore has a little bit more time in wood, and Bulgari Sassicaia is the only appellation in Italy which just has one wine. So Bulgari Sassicaia is just Sassicaia. There's nothing else comes under the Bulgari Sassicaia appellation. It's just that one. And uh, I can say that um, there are a few producers here which were already producing wine when Sassicaia was growing, was was uh, becoming famous who at the time had very little um very little nobody knew anything about them nobody wrote anything about them and if you were very lucky back then you bought some of those wines <laughs> and uh, and you put them in your cellar because they're now selling for rather large amounts of money uh, i remember back in i uh, can't remember the year exactly but i think it was probably 1991 so uh, quite a long time ago, we were living in Pisa and my, uh, at the time, my boyfriend and I, my, my now husband, went to Sassicaia. We wanted to go to Tenuta San Guido, which is the home of Sassicaia, and to try some Sassicaia. So, of course, being completely, having no idea what to expect, we just turned up outside Sassicaia's gates and rang the bell. And not surprisingly, got absolutely no, no answer at all. Uh, yeah, they didn't even answer and say hello or anything. So we just felt we were slightly disappointed. And back then, by the way, you could buy Sassicaia for uh, a lot less than it is now. I think we did buy some 
at that time and I think we paid the equivalent of around about um, 15 pounds maybe 15 euros a bottle something like that for it uh, so yes things have changed slightly uh, but on that particular day when uh, Tunutu Sanguido didn't answer the uh, answer the door um, we just walked around the corner slightly disappointed and came across a little winery called Gratamaco, which was just around the corner from Tinuto Sanguido. And there was a lady standing outside the door of this little, of this little um, winery. And we just sort of said, oh, do you make wine? Are you, know, are you connected to anything? She said, oh, yes, we do. We make a, we make a, a blend called Gratamaco. And we said, oh, so we tasted it and we bought some and we put it in our cellar. And several years later, I swear to God, it was absolutely stunning. So, um, yeah, but I think we probably paid about five pounds for it a bottle. So in those days, that was definitely the best thing to do is to buy wines from areas which are growing and getting better. Uh, so yeah, lovely story. I like that one. Uh, so just uh, just to, like you see, you can see there international varieties. Sassica is the big boy. Odnelaya, of course, is another one that is huge here. And I've got some other producers down there on the right. There's been interest from uh, producers in uh, Piemonte, uh, from other parts of the world, who've bought land here in Bulgari, in Bulgari Superiore, to make wine because this is, you know, it's huge now. These wines are almost as important as any other wines in, in the rest of Italy. Um, thank you, Julia. And uh, just to sort of like clarify that that whole thing, really, the Super Tuscan. And if you think back to the beginning of this webinar, when I was saying about how Chianti has changed and, and how Chianti Classico has changed, uh, you could almost put it down to a lot of it back, back to what happened here with the Super Tuscan. It changed the face of the Italian wine industry, not just Italy, but it also had an effect on the European wine industry because rules are very strict. Everybody did things in a certain way and had done things in a certain way for, you know, generation after generation. And the Super Tuscan changed that. It changed the face of the Italian wine industry. Uh, I mean, we, I go through this li a little bit for you, but uh, this, it started off with um, uh, the uh, Marchese Mario Incisa della Rocchetta, and it is still the Incisa della Rocchetta family, which owns Tinufo Sanguido, which makes Sassicaia. He actually had a friend who had some Cabernet Sauvignon vines not far from not far from there, closer to Pisa, and they had noticed that, of course, their soils in in uh, in Bulgaria were very different to those that you find in the rest of Tuscany. That they were these clay, gravelly soils, and so Sangiovese just doesn't work there. So they decided, for fun, apparently, I don't know how much of this is true, but for fun to plant these Cabernet Sauvignon vines and see what happened. So they, they planted these vines and they made their first wine in 44 and they were genuinely quite disappointed by the result. And as the story goes, the wines were left in, in uh, vats, they were left in their barrels and a few years later in a family dinner they decided to have another taste. And the result of that tasting was, oh my gosh, that's actually really quite good, maybe we need to relook at this. Uh, and it was at that point that they decided that they should take this seriously, that actually if this was done properly and not just for a bit of fun, perhaps they could make something really special. And so they replanted their vineyards uh, and they uh, planted more Cabernet Sauvignon and some Cabernet Franc. I think they changed the direction of some of the vineyards and made the vineyards larger. And they also brought in Giacomo Takis, who at the time was perhaps the most famous enologist in Italy and is still to this day is seen as one of the greatest enologists ever. Uh, he was brought in to sort of manage making the wine and when that wine was released everybody just went mad they they couldn't believe how amazing this wine was but what was special about it perhaps more than anything was it went against regulation so it was cabernet sauvignon in italy you know that's and cabernet franc and that in in italy going against this sort of tradition is it's difficult for people to to accept at the same time or very very close to that Piero Antinori from the big Antinori winemaking family released 100% Tignanello, 100% Sangiovese. Now Tignanello is a vineyard in Chianti Classico, so you're not allowed back then to make 100% Sangiovese. It wasn't, it was outside the regulations. So both this Sassicaia wine and the Tignanello and several other Chianti Classico producers at the time did the same thing, saw what had happened and appreciated that they had 
high quality vineyards and actually blending them with with colorino and white grape varieties um um that horrible white grape variety that uh, trebbiano toscano and things like that just made the wines worse so removing those and actually making 100 percent sangiovese they produce these amazing wines but of course because they were outside of regulations they were table wines vino da tavola so you had wines which were considered to be the best wines in italy and then these table wines which were the best wines in Italy so it was a it went against the grain everybody jumped on the bandwagon the, all the good producers started making things outside of regulation to a point uh, in 1978 uh, Sassicaia was in a blind tasting in London which had some of the at the time some of the finest wine judges in the world and it was a Cabernet Sauvignon tasting of about 33 wines if I remember rightly and um, uh, Sassicaia one. Now nobody had ever heard of it for a start and B that was the beginning of if you like the super Tuscan phenomenon. From that point people started to pay big money and it, you ended up paying more for a vino da tavola from Italy than what was considered to be Italy's fam you know most finest famous wines. So that's where the super Tuscan phenomenon started everybody started to go against the grain, new wood was bring, brought in, different grape varieties basically it was almost like a i'm just going to i'm not going to follow regulations because i'll make more money if i don't so it did kind of make sense and even to this day most top chianti classica producers produce a super tuscan even though they don't have to because since then what happened is chianti classica and and chianti and several of the other regions changed their regulations to allow these producers to use those grapes that they wanted to use they allowed them to have 100% Sangiovese. So you'll now have a Chianti Classico producer who will make a Chianti Classico, he'll make a Gran Selezione with 100% Sangiovese, and he'll make a Super Tuscan with 80% Sangiovese and 20% Cabernet Sauvignon, and they'll just go up in. So still the Super Tuscan will sell more than the Chianti Classico. So they're often, there's often a, a stylistic difference. The Super Tuscans tend to be really quite lush and plump, and round and full and sort of quite international in style. I say that most of them, apart from Sassicaia, Sassicaia still to this day is elegance personified. It is the, one of the most elegant wines you've ever drunk. If you've never had any, I'm sorry, come to one of the tastings, <laughs> the icons tasting, or, or, or I don't know, marry somebody rich or something, I don't know, make a lot of money. They're because they are expensive, but it's, there's something about Sassicaia which is just, it is one of the most beautiful wines. One of my favorite wines in the world, absolutely. Okay, Julia, sorry, thank you, one more, thank you. So moving on from um, the Super Tuscans to Vinsanto, and uh, without trying to make you too hungry, uh, if you were coming to this tasting in London, if I was actually, we were actually there with the wines, I would have today, I promise, I'm not making this up, I would have, made some uh, biscotti and brought them into London for you to eat with your Vinsanto because it is just perfection. Vinsanto and Cantuccini, Vinsanto and biscotti, it's just perfection. Whenever you're in Tuscany and you go for dinner to so a restaurant, at the end of the meal, rather than having dessert, you just have a glass of Vinsanto with some biscotti. It's just, I just think there's nothing better. I just think it's wonderful. So the Vinsanto that you find you, it grows all, you make, can make Vinsanto everywhere, all over Italy. It's the wine that was used um, originally in church. But here in Tuscany, it has developed into something a little bit more special. Uh, you can get it everywhere in Italy, though. It's not just Tuscan. Uh, you, so here you will find that the grapes are picked when they're very ripe. And they are either hung to dry, like in that picture, or some areas they will lay them out on mats for drying. And they will dry for a long time, three, three, four, five, six months, and they will reduce in, um, in juice by probably about two thirds. So what you get out of your, your grapes is very, very small amount of juice compared to if, they, if you just made a white wine from them. Then what they do is they, put, they will ferment them in, a, it's a little barrel called a caratello. They're about this big, so 50 litres, maybe 100 litres, some producers, but very small and they will be made in these barrels and they're usually just left there so they won't be racked they, they won't take them off their leaves they'll just leave them in the little caratelli uh, to age there sometimes for 
three years, four years, five, 10, 15, depending on the producer. And they can range in style from being relatively dry, depending on how sweet those dry grapes were to begin with, to extreme to lusciously sweet. And that again can differ depending on the vintage, on the style that the producer is making, on the quality of the fruit. They can range from a style of being really quite fresh. When I say fresh, I mean without any oxidative character, right through to wines which are completely oxidized. And this again comes down to producer style because what in the actual little barrel when they're making the wine, they'll always leave a tiny bit of air at the top, a bit of ullage so that the wine does naturally oxidize. Some wines will have more ullage than others. So barrels will have more ullage than others. So some of them will have a much more oxidative character than others. I personally like it when they've got a bit of oxidative character. If they're a little bit too fresh, they taste too much like other uh, sweet wines. And I just think when they, with the cantuccini, with the biscuits, and you've got that slightly oxidative style and they just, that honey and the dried fruit and they're oh, just divine. So you, that's another piece of homework you can take. And um, the only thing is I'll say here is that, uh, um, Oh, I've just he's just gone out of my um, head. Jamie Oliver, I um, I love Jamie Oliver, but in some ways I hate him because before he put Vincenzo and Biscotti in his book and on his television program several years ago, you could buy great Vincenzo at really cheap prices, but now it's really gone up because he's made it really popular. So thank you for that, Jamie. I love you and hate you at the same time. Okay, um, I think that's probably the only other slide on there is the um, vintage guide, which I think if you wanted to have a quick look at that, you can obviously do it. It'll be on YouTube, so you'll be able to see it. Uh, it is important these days, the vintage guide for uh, for the Super Tuscans and for um, and for the top Chianti Classico, for sure. It does, there are differences in vintages. It does, it isn't one of those regions where there's no vintage difference. So if you're going to be spending, if you're going to be investing in some of these top wines, it's definitely worth just checking on the vintage that you've got there. Okay, um, I think that I've probably talked myself hoarse and bored everybody's senseless now. So I think, uh, uh, Julia, are there any questions at all? I'm sure there were probably quite a few actually. Um, I'll just have a little look through. The first one I can see there um, was on um, how the drinking time, the longevity for Brunello, if you have any thoughts on that. Absolutely. Um, it depends a little bit on who the producer is because um, there are some very different differences in style. You'll find that uh, uh, if, you, if you're looking into it seriously, if you go to the, onto the consortium website, there's a map of Brunello and this southern region of Brunello, so the area which is a slightly warmer, those wines definitely don't have the same structure as some of those which are sitting on the east and the northern side of Brunello. So that, that's just a note because if you're spending between 60 to 100, 150 pounds, it's, it's worth you know, just noting that a little bit if you're planning on leaving them. The traditionalists, they age absolutely beautifully. So anything, I wouldn't open a good Brunello before it's 10 years old, to be honest. Uh, you, I just think, especially, um, the traditionists, which tend to have a little bit more structure than perhaps the modernists do, have gone for slightly riper fruit. And also, the, but, but having said that, the, the, the modernists are often using barrique. So again, if you go in there too early, you end up with barrique overpowering some of the fruit. So it's, I'd say it's definitely better to not go in there. If, if you can leave it for a good 10 years, and then the, from the top, top vintages, 20 years is not a problem at all for top Brunello producers at all, at all, and more. So I've just got to have a bit of patience then. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, uh, these days with modern winemaking, and especially those vineyards at the bottom, the southern end, which have riper fruit, you can drink them a bit earlier than that. I think I saw somebody was drinking a 2014 Brunello, and I would, I would expect that to be a little bit on the young side. So I would, ex and because at that stage, the tannins will be still really quite firm, it would definitely need that Bistecca Fiorentina with it, which actually would be rather lovely. <laughs> yeah, sorry, go ahead. Just sticking with Brunello, um, someone's asked whether it has to be the, that particular clone of Sangiovese, the Brunello clone in yes, the for Brunello. Does. Yes, so. it does. So, so the clone has, it has been identified as Brunello. There are several Brunello clones now because 
because it does continue to mutate. But they, but they, if it's if it loses its kind of range of clone, then it, it's not allowed. So it has to be taken out. So yes, it does have to be the clone Brunello. Yeah. I think I saw a hand raised there, Marianne. Did you have a question? Um, if you want to unmute yourself, um, please do. Not sure if anyone else has a question and wants to um, unmute themselves. Uh, do go for it. I'll just um, I'll end the recording here while we're finishing up.